<clears throat> All right. Hello and welcome to another curation. I'm your host, Corey the Curator. Uh, I've got something a little different here for you today. I'm going to start doing uh, two curations a week, uh, starting with uh, film on Friday, music on Monday. I, I, w I would have done that this week, uh, but I, I, I'm trying to catch up on some stuff to uh, come up with a good uh, film uh, curation that fits into that October theme. But um, this one, it's not really a cop out because the, the, these songs have been stuck on, in my head for weeks. Um, so we're um, going to curate one of my playlists here, one of my mixes. Um, <clears throat> what I have here for you today, it's, it's super niche. Um, I've got the Cherry Mythos and the works of JT Leroy. Uh, so one of my favorite things to do is uh, compile soundtracks, playlists, and mixes uh, based on concept themes or stories, both original and inspired by actual uh, uh, mythologies. A great example of this is the series of songs composed by a number of artists over the decades based on the character created by David Bowie for his hit record uh, Space Oddity, uh, Major Tom. I think uh, a lot of artists, I, th I think of artists as uh, bards, and the, and the words they create in their music is one of the examples of postmodern mythology. Um, uh, I'll be doing a future curation on the Major Tom mythos on this channel, so stick around for that. I just want to really uh, make sure that that's a lot more uh, research there. Um, today, I'm going to share with you a mythology that seems to be much, much less well known. Uh, perhaps because of the source material, something of a, an early 2000s cult phenomenon uh, by one J.T. Leroy, uh, the pseudonym of author Laura Albert. Uh, Jeremiah Terminator Leroy was to be this uh, traumatized, transgendered person that grew out of this uh, white trash existence, while Laura Albert, in reality, was a uh, cisnormative, uh, aspiring writer. Uh, this led to her being maligned by the public, most of which were devout fans, because like it or not, she was an important LGBTQ figure at the height of her work's popularity there in the early 2000s. Um, she published a book of short stories in 98 uh, that I couldn't find, uh, although I saw sources uh, citing it. Um, uh, and then uh, the novel Sarah a couple years later, um, and then The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things later um, adapted into a film starring the, the Sprouse Twins in one of their first roles. Uh, Marilyn Manson was in that movie, uh, uh, and Asia Argento, who also produced this movie. Um, and then uh, the, lastly, the novel uh, Harold's Inn, that was the last one by J.T. Leroy that I could find. Um, the Heart is Deceitful is kind of a prequel to Sarah, uh, though having a, a blurry timeline and, and tone as Sarah is vastly more humorous. Uh, the Heart is Deceitful is, is, is much more serious. Um, see, this is very, very dark subject material, uh, which was on the rage in, in the indie alternative scene as there were myriad films and books romanticizing, sensationalizing, and fetishizing trauma. Uh, and drug use, uh, such as Requiem for a Dream, Basketball Diaries, Kids, A Child Called It, uh, which scarred me, uh, just to name a few from that era. <clears throat> Though again, there was dishonesty in the content of the works by J.T. Leroy as they were marketed as autobiographical. Uh, the public was not aware that this person was a character. Uh, what happened to Laura Albert was I would say similar to uh, the expose of uh, James Frey and A Million Little Pieces. Uh, if you remember that, it was a big piece on Oprah. Um, see, these books, among the other works that I mentioned, were super important to the gay and trans communities, along with victims of, of uh, abuse, drug addictions, identity issues, or just being on the fringes of society. It, it, that, that was the representation that was there. Uh, when something is presented as genuine, people invest a lot of sentiment into it. And when it was found out as being not genuine, it, it's, hurt, it's hurtful. Uh, thus, unfortunately, it looks like the writings by J.T. Leroy have halted. Uh, perhaps she met her in too soon in a truck stop, or she found happiness and settled down somewhere. That, that's what I like to think. Um, 
though some say that there are still stand-ins appearing as, as at her uh, book signings and whatnot. Uh, there's a, a documentary on it uh, that, that you can find. Um, but it wasn't just niche subculture that these works inspired. Uh, J.T. Leroy was a muse for a number of different musical acts over the years, most notably uh, Shirley Manson, re uh, rest in peace, of, of Garbage. She was the front woman of Garbage. Um, she, she had a few tracks, uh, that fit in to their albums, um, which I would argue are concept albums. I, I would say a lot of Garbage's albums are concept albums, uh, with at least a few different recurrent themes, uh, but also there are arcs and characters within these works, um, and a few of them were based on the novels that I mentioned before, the J.T. Leroy novels. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, many of these grimy yet beautiful themes occur throughout different works at the time and predate J.T.'s novels. Uh, Garbage fit into the scene from the jump with their debut uh, self-titled album uh, with sex-charged weird lyrics, as well as songs dealing with identity, attraction, relationships, trauma, but with th this sort of fun, post-grunge, anti-pop rock feel. Um, the album was based on the character of, uh, let's see, oh, the album I'm talking about, though, is Beautiful Garbage, with Shirley stating that the single Cherry Lips was based on the character of Cherry Vanilla, or Sarah, or Jeremiah, the main character throughout those novels. Um, the rest of the tracks throughout the album seem to concretely tell her story, or at least pieces of it, with tracks like Androgyny, Drive You Home, and other songs about abuse. Uh, there is a connection to a more recent release, though, that actually drove me back down this rabbit hole. This freaking album's been stuck in my head for, like, weeks. I remember these works from around the time they released, being a pubescent, confused by boy and vehement uh, internet lurker along with the controversy uh, but recently I've been going through a synth phase and got back into the chromatics um, and there was a track that was familiar for a couple of different reasons cherry this mesmerizing tune is very reminiscent of cherry lips but also the lyrics seem to encapsulate that character again uh, speaking to her trauma, manipulation, confusion, and attraction. Now, Chromatics uh, haven't provided much insight on the song. A lot of people assumed it was based on the breakup of Johnny Jewel and Ruth uh, uh, Radelette, I, I hope that's how you say that, the front members of the band. Um, of course, anything is up for interpretation in this world of music and even legend. Uh, I sometimes drive people crazy with my constant dissecting and researching. Uh, because of, uh, after all, everything has a basis. And I always love to know the truth in the art. Cherry may also seem reminiscent to some due to the beat and lyrics being an homage to the song Candy by The Magnetic Fields, written by one Stephen Merritt way back in 92. Uh, peak grunge. Uh, though the, so the song is rather melodic and poppy as well. Stephen Merritt is actually on record as at least being in the same circles as Laura Albert, both knowing Pianio uh, Giannopoulos, famous senior editor and husband of Molly Ringwald. Um, there was this Pamplin Media uh, Group article from 2006 that, that I saw that mentioned them all and it seemed like they were all in the same circles. Um, there is a separate track on the Cherry EP called Candy, and there are other JT Leroy-esque tracks as well, like Lady on Film, Headlights Glare, and others. Uh, thematically, this album fits right into that universe. Interestingly enough, uh, getting into even more tenuous speculation, Candy was the name of the transgendered icon of the 1970s and friend of both Cherry Vanilla and Andy Warhol, uh, Candy Darling. Uh, J.T. Leroy stated that her character, Cherry, was named after Cherry Vanilla, and the figure was actually based on Candy Darling. Uh, again, we're not sure if this was uh, also the inspiration for Stephen Merritt's track or even the Cherry album by Chromatics, uh, but one could easily fit it all into that world. 
And I would argue most of the album, The Wayward Bus by Magnetic Fields, due to the themes and stories, or at least a soundtrack or playlist, um, thus I have included them on this playlist. Lastly, as far as some more solid connections, there are the songs Laura and Sarah by Bat for Lashes, a really cool band. They've got a lot of like fantastical and mythological themes, but also some are more down-to-earth stuff. Uh, it all seems kind of allegorical. Um, whoever writes their songs is a big fiction reader for sure. Uh, they base the aforementioned songs on both the works of J.T. Leroy's and their creator, uh, Laura Albert, and the story behind the creation. Um, I have also included a couple tracks that aren't necessarily based on the works, but also, again, just fit in thematically, particularly Hash Pipe by Weezer, a wacky song based on this transgendered uh, uh, prostitute in Santa Monica that uh, Rivers Cuomo um, encountered. Uh, he also wrote this song, uh, Dope, Nose on, Dope Nose on that same night, thus I've included it. Um, other honorable mentions on the playlist include Two Time Girl by Knoxville Girls and uh, uh, Beautiful Plateau by Sonic Youth, uh, which are the only songs I could find from the soundtrack uh, that was on the film um, based on The Heart is Deceitful. Um, the only things I, I could find. Uh, so Sonic Youth has also had a, a, a lot of these themes and arcs that sort of evolve with the other works through that time, um, that timeline. The trauma of the grunge era setting up for the sensationalizing of abuse that you see in entertainment and media um, of the mid to late 90s. Then it sort of takes this bright and poppy turn in the early 2000s. You can really see like the fringes of society evolve through the art and media of that time, you know. They're, of course, everyone's going to mention that the grunge was this sort of hangover from the excess of the 80s, and the 90s was sort of this crawling out of that hangover. And then in the 2000s, we kind of took a look back on that, on all that, and uh, it, it, it's kind of like when you look back on a night of partying, that the actual night was not that fun, but much later on, you can look back and laugh at it and, you know, give the, the, the story a proper spin, you know? Heroin chic. Um, so I could go on and on about this effect, but I think that it is demonstrated in this microcosm of a musical journey I have here. Uh, so I've got a link to the mix below. Let me know if you've got any recommendations or criticisms. I'll also include some links to uh, Jeremiah Terminator Leroy's novels. Uh, uh, enjoy and stay snide.